My name is Tom, and I'm an alcoholic. First time I got drunk, I drank about a half a gallon of wine in 15 minutes, and wound up feeling, feeling great, actually, for about a half an hour. Just feeling absolutely no pain, feeling better than I'd ever felt before, feeling like I'd been released from some kind of cage or prison. Alcohol abuse is the number one youth drug problem today, according to recent nationwide surveys. The use and abuse of alcohol by young people is an old problem, but there are new concerns based on growing evidence that teenagers start drinking younger, more frequently, in greater quantities, and that the destructive consequences of their drinking are more serious for society and for themselves. Tom, for instance, got drunk for the first time when he was 15. My thoughts after I sobered up were, I gotta do that again, which I did. It wasn't until like six months later, well, even before that, three months later, I was uh, a daily drinker. I believe that I was one of these people who was just waiting for the alcohol to be added to my physical system to trigger the disease called alcoholism. Teenage drinking is often viewed as a natural part of the transition from childhood to adulthood. Because alcohol is a socially accepted drug, cheaper and easier to obtain than other drugs, and because the penalties for underage drinking are far less serious than for using illegal drugs such as heroin or cocaine, alcohol has emerged as the drug of first choice for increasing numbers of young people. In a recent survey, over 80% of the high school students questioned said that they had had at least one drink in the past year. 20% reported drinking once a week or more. 8% reported drinking three or four times a week. And nearly 2% reported drinking every day. Dr. Ross Fishman director of education and training for the New York City affiliate of the National Council on Alcoholism, explains why teenagers begin drinking and why they establish certain drinking patterns. One of the reasons teenagers drink is because adults drink. And teenagers are moving toward adult status. Uh, as they feel ready for it, they will begin to do that. We could make a list of all the reasons given why teenagers drink, and we could then break those down into four major categories. Uh, one of those would be curiosity slash experimentation. Everybody's doing it, what's it all about? I'd like to try it too. Uh, some people say it's great, other people say it, it isn't. I want to find out for myself. So that's one. A second is parental modeling. Most of the behaviors we perform are behaviors that our parents exhibit in one way or another. And it's just a matter of time before we begin to do those things too. There are some exceptions to that. If obviously a parent is abusing alcohol in a detrimental way, a destructive way, and we say, well, that seems like a little too much. I don't want to be that way. But by and large, we absorb without knowing it, the reasons for drinking by what we see. A third reason is peer pressure. And even though parental modeling has the greatest long-term influence on why people drink at any age, peer pressure has the greatest immediate influence. By the way, there are two aspects to peer pressure which uh, most people don't appreciate. One is the real peer pressure when someone says, hey, look, if you don't drink with us, then don't hang around with us. You know, if you want to be one of us, then that's what you have to do. I'm not so, so sure that there's all that much actual peer pressure. I know it exists, but not as greatly as we may think. I believe that the other kind of peer pressure is imagined peer pressure. And that is where a, a young person says to himself or herself, 
I better drink because if I don't, they will reject me. And you go along because you are, you anticipate rejection if you don't drink, but you may not be giving reality a test to see whether they will accept you for who you are and who you want to be. The fourth reason for teenage drinking is where there may be some kind of emotional disturbance. And it could be running from mild anxiety to uh, severe psychopathological symptoms. It could be a psychosis, hallucinations, a paranoia, all sorts of things, depression. And uh, one doesn't start drinking for those reasons. One first has to have the alcohol to feel what it's like. And then if you've discovered it does something for you, when you begin to feel some of the disruptions from emotional disorders, you may use the alcohol because that's the effect that you like and it makes you feel better. Along with the use of alcohol comes the abuse of alcohol. Approximately 31% of students surveyed said they had been drunk at least six times during the year. An estimated three million teenagers are problem drinkers. The problem drinker is different from typical teenage drinkers in the way he or she uses alcohol. The problem drinker uses it more frequently, in larger amounts, and usually for the purpose of getting drunk. There are several reasons why young people may abuse alcohol. One might be to draw attention to problems in the home. Uh, another might be to be accepted by one's friends and drink as they do. Another is that alcohol comes to have a particular effect on them that is a positive effect of eliminating anxiety, temporarily forgetting problems that they cannot solve, dealing with feelings that they really can't handle, and it, the alcohol suppresses those feelings. The difficulty, of course, is that those feelings come back, those problems come back, those conflicts come back. And if you then take another drink to deal with the return of those problems, and you get that rewarding effect again, little by little you turn more and more toward alcohol as a way of feeling better. But it will always be temporary. Alcohol has different effects on different people. Uh, there is some thought that there is a genetic or inherited component in people that may make them more likely to respond to alcohol in a way that's different than other people. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they are destined to become alcoholic. It seems to me that uh, alcoholism is an outgrowth of alcohol abuse. That is, it's a, a later development in terms of drinking problems. Alcoholism is recognized by major public health agencies as an illness or disease that involves both a physical and mental deterioration. At the present time, it is believed to be an incurable and potentially fatal disease, although it can be treated and arrested. The stereotype of the alcoholic as a skid row bum is misleading. Only three to five percent of active alcoholics are dropouts from society. The great majority of active alcoholics are from all walks of life, from every rung of the economic ladder, every race and religion. Most have jobs and are still affiliated with their families or friends. But for most alcoholics, active or inactive, that is, drinking or not drinking, alcohol is a powerful drug that they cannot use safely. Although teenage problem drinkers don't usually suffer from physical disabilities such as liver or brain damage associated with the disease, their chronic misuse of alcohol, whether on a regular basis or during periodic binges of heavy drinking, can disrupt their lives or even lead to tragedy. For some, alcohol begins as a beverage and eventually takes on the quality of a drug. 
This is Tom's story. I had my first drink when I was 15. I started cutting classes and bringing alcohol into school, ripping off small change from my mother's pocketbook, um, ripping off bottles of bourbon, vodka, scotch, whatever, whatever I could get from my father's liquor cabinet, buying uh, quarts of Colt 45 in Old English, uh, sneaking out to the park across the street to drink those, um, drinking them in empty classrooms, drinking on the top floor of the building of this school, all this kind of stuff. Uh, at this time, I was a pretty isolated drinker. I, I didn't have any close friends or uh, sense of connection with the people around me. So, uh, you know, I, I drank alone and lived in, in my head, in the fantasy world, which is the way I thought I preferred it. I was busted for drinking several times at this school. At this time, I, I drank uh, both in and out of school. I did as little work as I could get away with doing. Uh, I cut classes unmercifully all through. Somehow, I managed to graduate from high school, but, you know, by the skin of my teeth, and um, got into college in Vermont. Now, I had no idea why I wanted to go to college. I certainly had uh, no, no intentions at the time of uh, preparing for any kind of career or anything of that nature. Anyway, the, the time I spent at this college, uh, I really didn't connect with the people at all. Once again, it was the story of my life, and uh, you know, the, the alcohol was the only thing that I felt I connected with at all. I cut classes again unmercifully was uncomfortable all the time, but most comfortable when I was drunk and out of it. I was an oblivion drinker, and I liked to get to the edge and uh, to the place where I, I just didn't feel or, and didn't care about anything. And my favorite pastime was to sit in my room alone and get drunk listening to uh, records. I was consuming great quantities of beer, cheap wine, and wh whatever I could get my hands on. Uh, a lot of alcohol, a lot of downs. Totally uh, no, no self-esteem, no confidence, no, uh, no sense of any kind of self-worth, you know. The alcohol just uh, kind of dominated me. Eventually, uh, it became obvious that, uh, you know, it was either uh, slit my wrists or drop out of college. This was the way I saw it, actually, at the time. Next few years, I kind of bottomed out. Um, got kicked out of my parents' house. I got a hotel room and began drinking. Started off with a pint of Southern Comfort and quickly moved up to uh, quarts of vodka. Uh, spent eight days drinking in this hotel room, and uh, a really strange thing happened in that I, I, I drank huge quantities of alcohol, but, but couldn't get drunk so this time out. You know, I, could, I, could only, I only got sicker and sicker, and uh, just sat on the edge of this bed, sucking down vodka and beer, whatever else I had, and uh, chain smoking, retching, dry heaving, uh, praying to die. And uh, I'd reached the point where I couldn't get drunk, I couldn't get sober, I couldn't live, and I couldn't die. And uh, I was ready to throw in the towel. Uh, set, set of really fortuitous circumstances uh, led me to uh, an alcoholism rehabilitation center where I stayed for three months. Started to take uh, myself seriously, started to realize that I, I'd been sick, very sick for a long time, that I was indeed an alcoholic, and that uh, if, if I wanted <clears throat> any kind of life, I'd have to put down the drink. Within the past few years, significant numbers of young people with alcohol-related problems have been seeking help. There are very few alcoholism treatment facilities that are designed specifically for teenagers, however. Most are set up as adult clinics, and parental permission is needed for teenagers who need treatment. Treatments vary according to the person's needs and can include hospital detoxification, rehabilitation centers, outpatient clinics, therapists, 
the highly respected Alcoholics Anonymous, and other support groups. Because alcoholism usually develops gradually, recognizing their problem and seeking treatment is difficult for some people. Dr. Fishman explains. Our tendency is not to believe that we have any kind of problem, whether it's uh, alcohol abuse or alcoholism, and to minimize any problem and to say it's temporary and so on. Part of the difficulty with that is that it's very easy to fool ourselves when we want to be fooled. Part of the development of alcoholism is a change in attitude about one's own drinking so that it becomes more and more acceptable and you see it as less and less of a problem. Friends or relatives often contribute to the self-deception or denial of a problem drinker. Well, if you had a friend with a drinking problem, you might not be able to go up to that person and say, uh, you know, Joan, I think you've been drinking too much. Why? Well, you could say, well, it's none of my business and all that stuff. You don't want this person to say, hey, you know, I don't need you. Get lost. And because you've confronted that person, there's a good chance that she would not want to have anything to do with you. Because you've, you've pointed out her vulnerability. You've told her that her drinking is no longer acceptable to you. In other words, what contributes to an individual's denial of a problem, that I, I have a drinking problem, is because no one else comes up to verify it. If you don't tell me that I'm abusing alcohol, then I can deny that I'm abusing alcohol, because I really don't know how to get out of it. And I'm too ashamed to ask. Many people are reluctant to ask for help because they consider it a sign of weakness. In reality, it takes strength and courage to admit that you need help, as Tom did, and to make use of the resources available to you. Recognizing the problem and seeking help or treatment are necessary steps for the problem drinker to take. But many experts believe that prevention of alcohol abuse is a necessary step for society to take. A large segment of the public, according to a recent poll, advocates raising the minimum legal drinking age as a first step toward controlling abuse. Since the ratification of the 26th Amendment in 1971, giving 18-year-olds the right to vote, Many states move to grant young people full majority rights, including the right to drink. Between 1971 and 1975, 19 state legislatures lowered the legal drinking age to 18, others to 19 or 20. The rationale was that persons old enough to vote and to serve in the armed forces were old enough to drink. Many people viewed this trend as a realistic and reasonable way to ease young people into a drinking society. The strongest opposition came from highway safety authorities who feared that the combination of inexperienced drinkers and inexperienced drivers would play havoc on the highways. And indeed, statistics proved them correct, at least partially. There was an increase in fatal accidents involving 18 to 20 year olds in reaction, several states raised the legal drinking age. Studies indicate that the car accident rate dropped in those states, and there is strong pressure in other states to raise legal drinking ages. Many other people believe, however, that legal age requirements don't prevent young people from getting alcohol, and that raising the age will only encourage illicit drinking. They contend that teenage drinking merely reflects drinking in our society generally, and that the best way to prevent abuse of alcohol is to educate children about alcohol at an early age before attitudes, values, and behaviors are fixed. Alcohol education in schools is mandated by law in most states. Many experts believe, however, that in addition to factual knowledge about alcohol and its effects, the alcohol education programs should focus on alternatives to the misuse of alcohol. They maintain that alcohol abuse would decline sharply if young people developed abilities to solve problems, recognize their feelings, cope with anxiety, and achieve greater self-esteem. They believe that in approaching the problem of teenage alcoholism, 
it is important to keep in mind the fact that most teenagers who drink don't drink too much or too often, and that a substantial proportion of adults drink moderately and safely or not at all. After all, people do what they want to do. The choices of whether to drink, when to drink, and how much to drink rest with the individual, as do the consequences. The decision is yours.